Hey, thanks for tuning in. In Isaiah 26, uh, verse 12 and 13, he says, O Lord, you will ordain peace for us, for you have indeed done for us all our works. O Lord our God, other lords besides you have ruled over us, but your name alone we bring to remembrance. I saw this and it kind of jumped out at me. Uh, a few of uh, these um, devotionals back, I uh, spoke to you about the perfect peace that God uh, gives to us in Christ because uh, he paid the price. Uh, he removed all the obstacle. He removed all the enmity between God and man and the offers us the beautiful gift of righteousness and peace in him. And so we know that we have this peace, but I, I thought it was very interesting that he says, for you have indeed done for us all our works. The, 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 uh, the prophet saw that the great things that Israel had experienced over the many decades uh, as formed as a nation and their great victories and their triumphs and and yet in their rebellions, his redemption and restoration. He says, all of these works you have done. You see, that is exactly what we as Christians are called to recognize. That he gave his life for us so he could live in us, but... That's not the end of the story. It was so that he could live his life through us. We know the great story of the Apostle Paul and the transformation of his life. And he said in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 10, he says, But the great, but by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace towards me was not in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them, though not, it was not I, but the grace of God that is within me. Now, if you take it out of context, you might say, well, gosh, that's a lot of boasting by Paul, uh, but not really, because he recognized that the Lord who gave his life for him and redeemed him from his sin, his self-righteousness, worked through him in a powerful way. That as he surrendered to the indwelling presence, the grace of God was expressed powerfully through him. And that's the gift, the calling that each one of us have to remember that you know, life isn't about me and what I want or what I desire, but what he wants and desires to do in and through me. And so Philippians 2.13, for it is God who works in you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. As we surrender to him, we see God working to transform our desires to be in alignment with who he made us to be, his own children. And he works in us and through us for his good pleasure. So I don't have to stir up and think, oh, I gotta do something for God. I simply have to surrender to his indwelling presence. Let him align my desires with what he desires and say, Lord, here I am, work through me live through me. In Colossians 1.29, he says, for this I toil, struggling with all his energy that he powerfully works within me. So the Christian life is obviously not a life of passivity, and yet it is not self-driven, but spirit-driven. But that means there's a toiling and there's a struggling. But we're not left to our own resources. We have his energy that is ready and 
waiting to powerfully work through me and you. In 2 Corinthians 3, 5, he says, not that we are sufficient in ourselves to claim anything as coming from us, but our sufficiency is from God. Paul says, you look around and you see the, the gospel spreading around the world. And he goes, that's not me. That's not our team. That's not our sufficiency. That doesn't come from us. Our sufficiency is God. You see, friends, we need to remember that God himself wants to do a mighty and powerful work through each and, one of, uh, each and every one of us. You, we don't go to church just to hear something, to feel good. We go to be reminded, to be prepared for the work of our ministry. We say, well, uh, hey, you're a pastor, you're a minister, you're a missionary. Uh, go do God's work. God bless you. No, friends, all of us are ministers. All of us have a calling at your workplace, he wants to work through you and he's sufficient. He's your wisdom, your strength, your energy in all your toiling and everything you're called to do in your, in, in your whatever you do for a living in your career, it's his sufficiency, it's his wisdom, it's his life. And then the prophet says, other lords have ruled over us. They had served on some under, you know, great kings. And they served under kings that rebelled and then kings that called them to repentance. And then they served under the authority of, of foreign gods and kings and uh, came under great bondage. He says that in, in a sense of despair, other lords have ruled over us but your name alone we begin to remember it's, i think there is a temptation for us who come from the western world especially to kind of think well we have no kings we have no lords but anything we allow to direct or be an authority over our lives is to be under a false reign even if that is only sin. Romans 6, 17 and 18, he says, but thanks be to God that you who were once slaves of sin have become obedient from the heart to the standard of teaching to which you were committed and having been set free from sin have become slaves of righteousness. Oh, what's, what is the misnomer that says, I'm free to do whatever I want to do. And uh, we use this, uh, what we call freedom often in pursuit of whatever selfish desires we have only to find ourselves in bondage. He says, we were all slaves of sin. We think, oh, I was just doing what I wanted to. No, we were serving our master, sin. But when we hear the gospel, when we obey the call to entrust ourselves to Jesus, we have been set free from sin. Yes, there are times when we still sin, but we are no longer slaves. We're saints. We've been set free. And he uses this human terminology because he's trying to explain to us. He said, but now we're slaves of righteousness. Well, we've talked about it before. It's not us that we're slaves, but in the truest sense, as the beloved children of God, we have one Lord, one master, and that's why we practice righteousness, because that's who he made us to be. In 1 Corinthians Paul was dealing with all kinds of issues. They had come to Christ, but they had just kind of gone in every crazy direction, forgetting that they had been set free, forgetting that they were slaves of righteousness. And as he calls them back to purity, to a life that pursues the king and the kingdom, he says, 
Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own, for you were bought with a price. So glorify God in your body. Friends, let's make sure that there are no false lords ruling over us, that we're living true to our true selves. We are not our own. We were bought with a price. We had an old slave master that always led us into heartache and bondage and death. But we have a new Lord, a new master, who always leads us to glorify him as we allow him who lives in us to live through us. I hope it encourages you and I hope you have a great day. I love you.